What we're going to do today is talk a little bit about Yellowstone and Hot Springs, and maybe a little bit about what role they've played in um, the development of microbial ecology as a science, and, and just some of the coolness factor involved in these things. These are really, it's a really amazing environment, very interesting microbiology going on. Um, and we've talked about some of these. Uh, we talked about a lot of the thermophilic organisms, and we're going to talk about how these are investigated using microbial ecology technology. So, have any of you ever been to Yellowstone? One, two, a few people. The rest of you, go. All right? It's really an amazing place. Um, it's a huge park. If you've never been there, you have no idea of the scale of this park. Um, it's more than 50 miles north-south and, and almost 50 miles east and west. It, it's a huge chunk of land up in the, the northwest corner of Wyoming, overlapping a bit with Montana and Idaho. Um, it was the first national park in the world. Um, I've always said that it was it was established by Teddy Roosevelt. It turns out that's not the case. He established it, I think, as a, as a state park or a national something, and it was subsequently rolled over into a, a, na a national park. Um, and, and actually, it's part of a larger complex. To the south is the uh, uh, the Grand Teton uh, National Park, and there's the Eisenhower Freeway in between. There's some parks all around here as well. I think I went one too far. No. Okay. So, so what is this park? Why is it so interesting? Yellowstone National Park is the highest concentration of hot springs in the world. More than the Bay of Naples with Mount Vesuvius, more than Iceland, more than the hot springs of New Zealand and Fuji, more than all of those places combined. It is, it is a phenomenal, it's a one-of-a-kind place in the world. Now, why is it this way? It is this way because Yellowstone is a volcanic crater. It is one of a handful of super volcanoes in the world. And so this red line marks what amounts to the mouth of the volcano. Um, it, this is the caldera wall. Um, there are two magma domes underlying this. There, there's a larger magma dome that underlies this whole area, but fairly close to the surface there are two magma domes, and a lot of the hydrothermal activity in the park emanates from these two domes. Um, I don't remember on this slideshow whether I... Yeah, okay, I go straight into the pictures. Um, this volcano erupts once in a while. Um, it erupted 1.8 million years ago in a spectacular eruption that left volcanic ash covering the entire United States west of the Mississippi River. This, this makes you know, Mount St. Helen look, look like a toy. All right. Um, it erupted... So that was 2.4 million years ago. 1.8 million years ago was the big explosion that left ash over the entire north, uh, continent of North America. It erupted 1.2 million years ago, a relatively minor eruption, but nevertheless fairly spectacular, creating this crater here. And it erupted 600 million years ago in, in, in a very large eruption, creating the traps that surround this area down here, uh, a lava outflow. 2.4, 1.8, uh, .2, we're doomed. All right? Um, this, is a, this is a big, big volcano. Um, but it's not like it's not like a uh, a paraclastic flow volcano like the Hawaiian Islands and this sort of thing. It doesn't spew lava continuously out or anything like that. The um, what you see as volcanic activity is hydrothermal activity, hot water, and so you have a, a, an underlying hot rock area, and above that is rock that's fractured in a variety of ways. There are earthquakes every day in Yellowstone. Uh, many of which you can feel, and most of which you cannot. Um, this rock is all broken up, 
and it's full of groundwater. And so water flows down into that groundwater. It gets heated up in this, in this, in this uh, underground gravel is what it amounts to. Um, and then rises up through the surrounding polar groundwater and comes to the surface in the forms of various hot springs. Um, a typical hot spring has a high flow of both water and heat, and the result is it comes out at the surface at or near the boiling point of water. At this altitude, this is 94 degrees centigrade. Um, if there's a large underground chamber, this water gets superheated. It gets hotter and hotter and hotter. Remember, you've got hydrostatic pressure on top of this, and so that water goes to, gets to a very high temperature, starts to bubble a little bit, blows this water column off, and now this water really is superheated. That releases the pressure from this, and the result is large amounts of that water vaporize very quickly, and it blasts out of, the, out of the plumbing here in the form of a geyser. And then once it's blown off enough heat, that begins to fill up with hot water again and starts to heat up again, and the process can repeat. If the hot water flows through an area of rock containing sulfate, excuse me, containing sulfide, then sulfate reducers will live there. Um, excuse me, sulfate oxidizers will live there. Um, growing on that sulfide, producing sulfuric acid, and eating that rock up around it. That rock is dissolved in the hot water, and when it comes to the surface and cools down, it precipitates as a silica slurry, and we call these mud pots. It's not really mud, it's silica. We'll show you some of those. And if the water flow is relatively low and the heat flow is relatively high, all that comes out of the spring is steam. And we call these fumaroles. And I'll show you some pictures of all this. So this is the standard one, right? I mean, everyone has to, if you go to Yellowstone, you have to take a picture of Old Faithful. Um, these pictures, by the way, were taken over a number of years. I go whenever I can, um, sometimes for scientific purposes and sometimes not. The fish in there is really good. Um, this is Old Faithful, and all this stuff here is geyserite sand. So that this water, when it comes up to the surface, is typically saturated with silica, um, and the water cools down, of course, and that silica comes out of solution, and you get this loose center silica sand that people call geyserite. Notice, by the way, this picture was taken in 1992, I think. In 1988, there was a huge fire in Yellowstone, and all these trees you can see are burned out in the background. They fought really hard to save this part of the park. A third of the park burned in that year. This is Excelsior Geyser. Now, does this look like a geyser to you? It probably shouldn't. Um, this was a geyser, and then in about 1880, the geyserite center built up around that geyser so much that it closed the plumbing off completely. Well, that hot water's got to find some place to go. And it didn't have any place to go. And so it exploded. And it blew a big chunk of ground right up off, off the crater. And what's left is a, is a crater. And this Excelsior geyser produces more water than any other hot spring in the world. It's a huge boiler. So this is the water, some of the water flowing out of Excelsior. Uh, you can see the burned out trees in the background. Uh, this is sedge. It's a kind of grass that's pretty resistant to sulfide and, and, and high temperatures. Uh, all this stuff here is microbiology. It's all geyserite sand. This is a microbial mat. This is a photosynthetic microbial mat. The green is Synecococcus, thermophilic blue-green algae. The gold is chloroflexus, and these, these are the two major kind of microbial photosynthetic mats in the park. These things are pretty thick. They're, they're maybe six inches thick, uh, full of sand and, and goo and everything. Um, the water temperature in, in this area here is 70-some uh, degrees. The water here where it's gold is 60 degrees centigrade. It flows into the Yellowstone River, which is 2 degrees. This is another picture of the adjacent hot spring, which is Grand Prismatic. 
I'll show, I think I've got an overhead picture of this later. You can see, again, the burned out trees in the background. Look at the colors in this thing. And if you look at the original, instead of on this display, they're, they're much more spectacular. Um, in the neutral pH springs in Yellowstone, you don't need a thermometer to get a pretty decent guess about what temperature it is because the, te the colors tell you the temperature. Blue is in the 90s. Pink is in the 80s. Green is the 70s. Orange is the 60s. Black is in the 50s or below. And it's all because of the communities of photosynthetic organisms that thrive at those different temperatures. Um, the green is the, is the highest photosynthetic color. Pink is thermos and thermocrinus that we'll talk about, a different kind of microbial mat that's a chemolithotrophic mat. And the blue is likewise um, members of the or, uh, group Aquifex, which are chemolithotrophic. This is grand prismatic from the air. 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, and 50s. Um, this is a walkway. These are tourists. This walkway is six feet wide. To show you the scale of this thing, this thing is um, fairly shallow over most of its depth on the order of, of four or five feet deep um, until you get to the mouth of the plumbing, in which case it goes down more or less indefinitely. I mean, the, where the pipes and things that feed this thing come from, nobody knows. This is all geyserite, sand, and old microbial mat around this and steam and all that kind of stuff. Oops. I need to remember that PCs have two buttons on the mouse. So this is a microbial mat close up. This is all chloroflexus. This, and there's some sulfur oxidizers in here. Um, this mat is about six feet thick and covers something on the order of 50 acres. So it's a huge ecosystem. This is Opal Spring nearby. This, pea, this, this, um, this spring, which is just a stone's throw from the others, is slightly alkaline, about pH 8 and a half. The result is the silica forms almost a colloid um, in, in the water that gives us this opalescent appearance. Again, this is all geyserite sand, forest in the background. You see this mountain range? Those are the Galantine Mountains. Uh, another thing, though, that is, is the wall of the caldera. Uh, you're inside the volcano in this part of the park. This is Silex Spring, which is also nearby. Uh, it gets one of these uh, alkaline opalescent springs. These springs um, get more and less active over time. They're not stable. I mean, you might think of them and look at them and say, well, these are ancient structures that have been here forever. But they change from year to year, uh, depending on... Um, various geological activity going on in the park, um, just on water flow, and, and so forth. If you've been to Yellowstone recently, you, you may have gone to the West Thumb area. I don't think I've got any pictures of that. And there's this whole tourist area, and you, and you look at the springs and stuff, and you find they're not very interesting. And the reason is, is because in 1980, there was an earthquake in the park, and those springs are becoming more or less extinct. And other areas of the park have become very, very much more active. <laughs> Um, this, this spring has gotten very much more active in recent times. And you can see that these used to be living trees. They used to be surrounded by forest. But now this water has infiltrated the surrounding soil um, and killed all the trees. I think I've got a picture. And you can see the chloroflexus map that surrounds them as well. Yeah, I do have a picture of this. This is the water flowing out of this. This is old tree roots. It's just an interesting picture. We think of fossilization as something that takes a long time. And this is usually the case. But in this sort of hydrothermal environment, fossilization can happen in a geologic instant. These trees still have pine needles in them, on them, right? This is petrified wood. These trees are being fossilized before our very eyes. I think I've got a picture later on that shows a tree that's still alive. It's still got green needles on it. And the base of that is completely turned to stone. But 
firewood is fairly common in the park, as you might imagine. It's a federal offense to take some, but I've got a big chunk anyway. <laughs> this is Great Fountain Geyser. This is um, downstream from the, the, the main tourist part of the park. This is, a, this is a, a very popular fountain because it's very spectacular. It throws hundreds of gallons of water up into the air. Um, and these, these tourists will get soaked. There's a, there's a stand there. It, it, it's okay because the water comes out boiling hot, but when it gets blasted into the air, it falls back to the ground. It cools off in the process. It's, it's just warm at that point. It's popular amongst tourists because you always know when it's going to go off. It goes off sporadically, but there are a number of places in the park where there are so-called indicator geysers. And so this thing in the back is an indicator geyser. Fifteen minutes after this erupts, and it's, it's a pathetic eruption, it just spits water up a few feet into the air and that's it. But fifteen minutes after this goes off, this one's going to go off. And so they post a notice in, on, in, the, um, in the lodge, which is just uh, maybe three miles away, um, that Great Fountain Geyser will erupt at such and such a time, and everybody swarms over here to, to have a look at it. And you can see the terraces. As this hot water cools and flows out, it cools. That, that silica comes out of solution and builds up these beautiful terraces. And, the, and you get microbial mats growing in those terraces. So this is a popular place. It's a little off the beaten track, but it's a popular place. There's a, there's a road that goes back this way, the Firehole Lake Road. Um, and there's an area where you can park. Right, if you instead of walking on the tourist walkway to Great Fountain Geyser, you go the other way across the street and follow the little path that's there. Um, in about 200 yards, you'll run into this thing. This is Octopus Spring, and until about 10 years ago, Octopus Spring was by far and away the best studied hot spring in the world. It's easy to get to. It's small. It's fairly stable. Um, and it is off the beaten track, so you don't have issues with tourists and so forth. Not usually. Um, this is the source spring right here. Um, hot water flows in from here. Most of it flows over this shallow area into this big holding pool. That water, as you can see, is 90-some degrees, boiling hot. And then most of that water flows out over this mat right here and down to the, the White Creek. That's the name of the creek, White Creek. Then it flows, and some of this hot water flows directly out into this other spring right here. Uh, it, you can probably tell from the look of this that this spring has changed a lot over the years. Um, in the 60s, this spring, this shallow photosynthetic mat area covered this entire area right here. Some of it flowed out this way. And so from above, it was a... a big roundish area with fingers that head it off, and that's where it gets its name, Octopus Spring. It's become very much less active. This is where uh, Thomas Brock, who wrote the, the, the main microbiology textbook a lot of people use, got his start of studying the spring. These are the pink filaments that live in these offsprings. This is, the springs. This is where the, the pink zone around the... Uh, the, the different springs comes from. These pink filaments, we talked about this a little bit earlier, are made of Thermocrinus ruber. Um, this is where Thermus aquaticus was isolated, um, and all the biotechnology that's come from that comes directly from the spring. This is geyserite gravel, broken up bits of geyserite sand. This is the precipitate along the edge of the spring here. Um, for a long time, nobody could prove that these things were alive or isolate them, do anything with them. And we're going to talk um, after the next midterm about how this kind of environment was studied and ultimately the organisms cultivated. This is also octopus. This is a microbial mat here, photosynthetic mat that's been very extensively studied. These mats are amazing because if you, if you take a core sample through them and look at them, there are hundreds of layers. It, it, it's, it's a tissue, right? It's a photosynthetic tissue. It's different than the tissues in your body because the tissues in your body are all the same species, right? Here, the, the different components of the tissue are different species, 
but it really is a completely interrelated uh, organ system that converts light into energy and converts hydrogen and CO2 into organic material, etc. Um, you'll notice that this precipitate along the edge of the spring actually overhangs the edge of the spring. And this is one of the hazards of the park. I'll show you that. You should never walk too close to the springs here. And, it, and it, as a general rule, when you're in Yellowstone, if you're off the tourist areas, walk on the grass because that, the roots aren't going to be in hot water. And so as long as you walk on the grass, you're not walking over the surface of a hot spring that you don't know about. This is this photosynthetic mat. This has been studied to death. There are scars in this, little plug scars and cut scars and grids and this kind of stuff um, that, are, that are 40 years old uh, from the initial studies uh, on microbial ecology from these things. And they really are scars. They, 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 they persist there. This is Cynicocystis. And what's interesting is this obviously is a temperature gradient. The water gets cooler as it flows down here. And if you look at the Cynicocystis that are in those mats, they're morphologically identical. You can't tell them apart. But if you do the molecular biology, you'll find that there are bands of different specialized strains that live at different temperatures along this park, either from upstream to downstream or from the middle of the stream out to the cooler periphery of the stream. Specialized strains for every part of this, this map. That's White Creek in the background, and you can probably see, yeah, you can see the road here off in the distance. Right around here is a, is a group of springs called the Three Sisters. This is one of them. It, it's not so big. You could easily jump across this. Um, you, you'd really want to make it all the way to the other side. It's really hot. Um, however, you can see these are bison footprints that have walked across. But they have hooves, and so they'll, they'll do this sort of thing once in a while. It can't be very comfortable. This is one of the cooler sisters. Um, you can tell this by the color. So the water flowing out of this is 70-some degrees, and it cools down to 60 out here as it flows away. Um, you can see that organic material gets in here once in a while, feeding the, the spring some organics. This is black spring. This spring, so octopus spring is, is up here. So this is black spring, and this is flowing right into White Creek. Um, it's black because of the presence of iron sulfide. It's just like at the bottom of your Winograsky column. Um, and, and they're generated in the same way. You have sulfate reduction going on down in the subterranean uh, aquifer, and that water is brought up to the surface. This is all geyser right here in the background as well. This is another one of the sisters. This one is, is pretty hot. And you can see the water, this is darker up here. This is in the 70s up here. It's flowing out of this thing. This looks like a little, a little spring, maybe so big around. But you get as close as you dare and look down in there, and you realize it's about 15 feet in diameter. And you're standing on top of it. That's a really spooky thing to do. I wouldn't recommend it. It's all overhung. It's closing itself off slowly over time. You, you can kind of see in here it's bubbling hot. It's boiling, 94 degrees. Um, one of the, it's funny listening to the tourists sometimes, that, you know, the, the people talking around the, the main springs and things, and some kids suggest, wondered what would happen if you jumped in. And, and his mother, classic motherly line, right, says, well, think about when your grandma fries donuts. Not a pretty picture. Um, there, I've got a book in my office, Deaths of Yellowstone, and there's a chapter on people who end up in these hot springs. Uh, those stories are really awful. Um, there are cases where people, you know, have been taking a picture and you know take one more step, you know, one more step, and they end up in the spring. People running around, kids running around on these walkways. Uh, I think I mentioned the fact that a couple of times people have jumped in after their pets that ended up in the water. Um, so what happens when you blanch a tomato? Right? The protein denatures and the skin all peels off, right? Same thing happens with people. 
Any part of your body that ends up in this boiling water will die. You put your finger in, they're going to have to amputate it. If you're a, uh, a, a, an intoxicated uh, college student, freshman, or, or high school student do, doing uh, commissions in the summer for fun, and you play a game where you dare the other guy to stand a little closer to the edge of the spring and one of you falls in, you lose your legs. This sort of thing happens. Speaking of which, it happens not just to people. So this is, this is Roadside Spring. It's just a short distance. There's no tourist walkway or anything there. And if you look closely, you'll see that this is an elk skull with some ribs, femur, Here's a place where the edge of the spring has been broken through. Stood a little bit too close to the edge of the spring. The side broke away. Water, or the animal ends up in the water, and the bacteria have an infusion of organic material to live on for a while. These springs are surrounded typically by animal carcasses, skeletal remains. They, 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 they're kind of a gathering place in the winter. Winter in Yellowstone is harsh. Um, and, and so the animals gather around, particularly the sick and old, around these springs for warmth. Uh, the predators know this, and um, the result is you can find any, any elk or bison skeleton you want anywhere in the park. And, and this sort of thing happens once in a while. I found a bison skeleton on the bottom of Lake Yellowstone. We were doing some scuba dives in there once. I had wandered out onto the ice and fallen through, probably. This is uh, the Porcelain Basin, Norris Geyser Basin. This is, this is a, a fault line, a valley in the park, and it's completely filled with hot springs. This is one hot spring after another, this whole area. And this, this is just part of it. You can't get it all, obviously, in, in one frame. This is another part of it. This is the back basin. And there are hundreds and hundreds of hot springs Whoops, in this. This is Cistern Spring. This is a spring that, that heated up quite a lot in recent years, and you can see that it's killed all these trees in the background. It's kind of a lime green color, a combination of mineral precipitates, um, elemental sulfur in this case. There's a lot of sulfur going on, uh, being brought up by the spring, um, and the blue um, aquifex organisms all mixed together to create this weird color. This is a humid day, so you can see all the steam rising up off the spring. Some park ranger with a sense of humor. At least I find it humorous. I don't know. Danger, hyperthermal area, fearless geyser. This is Green Dragon Spring. There are a bunch of springs in the parks that, that have dragons and or lairs in their name. These are these are hot springs that don't come up out of the ground, but emerge in the face of a hillside. And the result is something that looks like a cave full of boiling water, and in there you've got this gurgling and hissing and sloshing noises and all this stuff. And, and so people think of them as kind of like a dragon's lair, um, and, and they get their names for that. This one's pretty pretty noisy. Um, it goes pretty far back. The, the, they've got it set up kind of interestingly. You walk through the North Geyser Basin, and then you, you make a left-hand turn and go down and realize that the walkway passes right over this. Here the microbial mat is on the wall of the stone not in the bottom. And you can see this is all chloroflexes here. Elemental sulfur down here. Bathtub spring, this is cool. Cool temperature-wise, it's, it's about 40 degrees, maybe a little less. Um, and, and apparently it gets its name because the, the folks in, in the 18th century would jump in here and wash off. You'd have to be pretty dirty for it to do you any good. This pool is not pleasant. But if you've been six months on the ranch, maybe it's a help, I don't know. <laughs> this is Black Rattler Fumarol. This is a steam vent. This, it's a big crack in the earth, filled up with geyserite on the side. Um, here's some chloroflexis mat here, iron sulfide. And, and, and this is like if you have, a, have the autoclave door not quite all the way closed. And steam blasts out of this and makes a great racket 24 hours a day, all the time. Quite a bit of hydrogen sulfide in the gas. 
And so it smells pretty bad. All the kids are walking around with their noses pinched. And you can hear the water gurgling around in there, and it's got to be 100 feet below the surface. This is Whirly Gig Geyser. This, this erupts every three minutes. Um, it's called Whirly Gig because the plumbing is kind of weird underneath somehow, and the spray spins around like a fire hose rotating around as it goes. Not real big. It, don't, it only erupts you know, so, so high up off the ground. But it's pretty cool. This is all iron hydroxide. This is an alkaline spring. Uh, right next to it is another spring. Um, it doesn't erupt. It's not a geyser, but it's full of copper. And that's, that's what this green color is. And so these two springs that are separated by no more than 20 feet have completely different chemical composition because the plumbing goes through different rocks on its way to the surface. This is the mud volcano. This is where we've moved north now, north of Lake Yellowstone. Um, and the springs in this area are acidic springs. And so they bring up a lot of silica slurry with them. Does that look like a mud volcano to you? No. Uh, in the early days of the park, this was a mud volcano, about 200 feet high, a nice conical silica cone. And then it closed itself off. That steam, had, that pressure or energy had to go somewhere. And you can, I mean, the picture tells the whole story, right? It blew itself uh, to oblivion. And what's left now is a relatively cool spring in the 60s. It's bubbling, but that's not steam. That's CO2. This, this water is carbonated. pH of about 3. This is parking lot pool. One day in the, in the 90s, a uh, tourist uh, mentioned to a park ranger that there was a crack in the parking lot and steam coming out of it. And to this day, there's just barricades around it, and, and the spring is emerging up out of the stone underneath the parking. This happens all the time, this sort of thing. They've had to move not just tourist walkways in the hydrothermal areas, but they've had to move whole roads as areas became active and destroyed the, the pavement. This is the mud cauldron. This is in that same area. This is called the... Um, no, I can't remember the name of this, this particular area. Tourist walkway goes up into the into the hills here. pH here of about two and a half. This is a mixture of real mud and and silica slurry, carbonated acidic water coming up out of it. How the sedge gets by here, I have no idea. It's pretty tough. Dragon's mouth. This is an acidic spring here in the hillside. This, this is mostly mineral rather than microbiology here. This is copper and iron. This is too acidic for the photosynthetic organisms we're used to seeing. This is Sour Lake, pH one and a half. Right in here. This is all elemental sulfur that you're seeing here. Silica as well. These are bison. These are tourists. Um, they are way, way too close to these animals, all right? Uh, an adult male bison weighs 2,500 pounds and can run 35 miles an hour, and you can't, all right? Um, people think they're in a, in a petting zoo or something. You see the most amazingly stupid things go on. Um, it's very common for the bison. The bison have daily uh, trails that they walk. And, and the, the, the standard routine is, is that the, the uh, lead males will walk first, they'll come to the road, and they'll lay down and sit there and let all the cows go by, and then they'll follow up behind them. And th these adult males are, are big, and they're spectacular, and they're right there off the road, and people want their pictures. And they'll walk right up to them, and I saw, I'm not kidding you, a tourist whack one of these things on the butt with a paperback book to get it to stand up to take a picture. Why that tourist wasn't killed then and there, I have no idea. There are gorings every year in Yellowstone, and they are very often fatal. You might as well mess with a locomotive. I mean, these, these animals are amazing. They're used to the tourists, and they're tolerant, but they're not that tolerant. 
This is Moose Pool. Uh, the Sour Lake is just on the other side of these trees. This is off the tourist zone now. Um, pH one and a half, uh, rich in sulfide, uh, rich in elemental sulfur, um, boiling hot. Does this look like a hospital envir hospitable environment? What could live in that? This spring is 10 to the 10 per mil Sulfalobus acidocaldaris. This, this is a giant fermenter. It's full of life. This is a site called the Pit. This is nearby. This is an area that became active after the 1980 earthquake. Previously, it was just a, a valley. Um, this is all silica sand. This is elemental sulfur. These are the remains of trees that were in the area before. Um, there was no fire here. This is what happens to wood that has to sit in the fumes of this spring. Um, any of you, do they do the nitrogen uh, assay in, in quantitative chemistry in the lab? It's called the Keltel reaction. No? If, if you treat cellulose with fuming sulfuric acid, it, it will just turn brown and fall apart. And that's exactly what's going on with this wood right here, sulfuric acid infusion. Oops. This is a site called Obsidian Pool. Uh, we're going to talk about some of these papers. It's also, in the older papers, it's called Jim's Black Pool. Um, this is um, a mixture of silica and pyrite, iron sulfide, right? Um, it's all built up here around the sides of the pool. Um, if this spring becomes extinct, and if it's buried and becomes uh, geologically transformed, it will become an obsidian deposit. This is where obsidian comes from. And obsidian is relatively common in the park area and was an enormously important trade product uh, of the Native Americans in the area. It makes you know really nice points for arrows and spears and so forth. This is a bison, and, and this is me on the other side of the pool. <laughs> they get fairly aggressive in this area because this is well off the tourist zone and they don't like to see tourists here, and it is on their daily walk path. This is now the most well-studied hot spring in the world. This, study, this, this spring has been pounded and pounded in, in the last 15 years or so. This is also obsidian pool, same thing. You can see this is another one of these springs you could almost jump across it. Boiling hot. There are parts of the sediment that are a little bit cooler. There's more diversity. People have looked at using molecular biology in this thing. There's more diversity in this one spring than there is in all the culture collections in the world. There's more diversity in terms of the number of species. There's more diversity in terms of the, the phylogenetic distance of all these groups in both bacteria and archaea in this one little spot. This is the kind of environment that probably life originated in. And that's why it was, has been so extensively studied. There's a whole backstory behind that, too. Jim, you know, the Jim Black back pool is me, but I've never done any work on the spring at all. I nag someone to do it. This is Graceland Sulfaterra. A Sulfaterra is a hot spring in which the, the hydrothermal water is injected directly into the soil and never reaches the surface in the form of a real spring. And so this is a, a very hot soil, very acidic, pH 2.5 or so, some, some photosynthetic stuff here growing on top of the soil, uh, lots of sulfuric acid. Um, my boss at the time walked across this with his hiking shoes, and, and the next day it rained, and all the laces of the shoes fell apart. The, I just, the sulfuric acid just ate it all away, cotton thread. This is just a, a site north of this. Here's all elemental sulfur. This is, this is right adjacent to Obsidian Pool. And so here we have one, one spring, maybe 10 feet long, five or six feet across, very highly reduced, completely full of iron sulfides. Here's one just right next to it, completely oxidizing iron. So these springs can be enormously different just right next to each other, depending on what the, the, the local conditions. There is a huge fault that runs north from the wall of the caldera 
to a site called Mammoth. There's a little village there, and there are a lot of hot springs. This is Jupiter Terrace. This, the, the water as it flows from the caldera up to this part of the park, which is 20, 30 miles away, um, absorbs carbonates during that travel. And those carbonates come out of solution up here to form these big limestone uh, or travertine terraces. This is Orange Mound Spring. There's a spring at the top, and this thing is just building itself up. It's something like 20 feet tall. All of this is chalk. This is a chloroflexus mat growing on the surface. Minerva terraces. These things form these terraces as the water on the periphery cools and the, and the material precipitates. So you have these beautiful, complicated terraces made out of uh, travertine. Angel Terrace, and you can tell the living ones, the ones with water flowing through them because they have these microbial mats. The really hot stuff is white because it's too hot for any photosynthetic organisms, and the black stuff is, is where there's no water flowing at all. Canary Spring, this is, this is actually a fairly uncomfortable walk depending on the uh, direction of the wind because this really hot air flows over the surface of this stuff and onto the walkways and things. It's pretty, it can be really very uncomfortable. This water, there's a lot, a lot of water flowing over this. Kind of a lime green color. That's where it gets the name canary from, from uh, elemental sulfur. Look at this tree. Completely embedded in this material. And yet it lives. You can't see it so well, but this whole walkway has been embedded in this chalk. It didn't used to be in the water flow, but as the water flow increased, it encroached upon these areas, and it's building up this layer after layer of travertine around everything that's there. Okay, so if you're not into slimy hot springs, there's other stuff in Yellowstone. This is kind of a standard picture of the uh, lower falls of the Yellowstone River. This is all geyserite. This is a full-size river down at the bottom. You can walk from up here down to the top, top of the lake. It's about a 30-minute walk, and the walk back is really strenuous. Uh, th this is, the picture gives you no idea of how deep this canyon is. These, these trees, these are full-size lodgepole pines here. And, yeah, people fall off of that once in a while, I'm afraid to tell you. Grand Tetons are just south. This is a uh, strike fracture fault. So you've got one where you've got a fracture in the earth and one plate is being driven under the other. And so the low side of that fault is Jackson Lake and the high side are the Grand Tetons. And if you're a hiker, this has got to be the best hike in the round. It's amazing. That's it. So I hope I've convinced you Go to Yellowstone.